Should we get started? Yeah. Well, good afternoon, and again, welcome to uh, Kansas Center Grand Rounds. Um, last year, uh, I think we uh, we uh, well we had sort of established a, a commitment to uh, inviting uh, our extraordinary nursing colleagues uh, to uh, lead discussions uh, at this forum and to really hear about the innovation that we're doing across all avenues of our clinical research operation. And, and I'm pleased to say that today's uh, Grand Rounds is, is an example of one of those. Um, and it's really the extraordinary success and uh, the transformative approach that has involved a large group of, of investigators, uh, clinicians, uh, and uh, staff across our entire cancer service line, namely the extended care clinic and how it has really impacted uh, patient outcome and the way we deliver care. And we have uh, two outstanding nursing leaders who are gonna share that, uh, that story and the outcome of that with us. And I'll, I'll introduce them both because they are, I think they've worked out a very seamless transition between their presentations. So I won't interrupt it with my introductions. And our two speakers, I think you all know, Vanna Dest is the uh, senior patient service manager for inpatient medical oncology. And I'm sorry, I, I got my mixed up here. Vanna, is, I'm sorry, has, is, the, uh, is the senior pra program manager for the advanced practice provider program at SMILO. Vanna has been uh, in oncology nursing since 1984 when she started as a staff nurse in, at St. Rayfield's. She received her master's degree from the Yale School of Nursing in 1992. Uh, has been the program manager for oncology advanced practice nurses uh, now, and um, has really in that role built an extraordinary community of, of highly sophisticated, uh, expert, compassionate uh, advanced practice providers at our hospital that I think is really transforming the way we deliver care. Maureen Rauchi is the patient services manager for inpatient medical oncology and now the extended care clinic. Uh, in 2014, she was named as the IM Yale New Haven Service Excellent Hero. At last year's uh, ONS annual meeting, uh, she reported on the launch of the extended care clinic, which you'll hear about in a moment, which was extremely well received. Uh, by the larger oncology community. So we're really very fortunate to have them both share with us that experience. So thank you. Thank you, Terry. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. We're very excited to talk about the Extended Care Clinic. I think over the past year and a half, it has just been a wonderful experience for our patients and a service that a lot of other institutions do not provide, but we have been able to do that. So just this session objectives outline driving forces triggering the oncology extended care clinic, describe the multidisciplinary approach to implementation strategy, review the lessons learned, and we have learned a lot of lessons and we continue to keep learning as time goes on, and discuss outcomes and future direction of the ECC. So where did it all begin? I mean, I think when we really think about it, one of the things that we know is that 30% of the total cancer expenditure is really spent in the last year of people's lives after their diagnosis. And 55% of this time is spent as an inpatient. But we do know that the pendulum of care has changed over the past decade, and certainly more patients are being treated as an outpatient, and that is roughly about 90% of patients. The transition to ambulatory care certainly enhances people's quality of life. Um, and a lot of it is due to the health insurance carriers, the oral chemotherapy regimens that we have, and certainly cost effectiveness. It is estimated that the new cases of cancer in 2018 is 1,700,000, and we know that that number is increasing. The estimated cancer deaths in 2018 is about 600,000. But we also know that cancer is a chronic illness. So there's more people that are surviving from their cancer, and therefore we do really refer a lot of our patients to our cancer survivorship program for the long-term follow-up that is required for them. The average five-year survival for all combined cancers is about 68%, and that is really reflective of all the newer therapies that we have. So with that, there's a lot of complex treatments, as we all know. Um, there's a lot of treatment-related effects. There's increased survival. And patients really have more urgent and emergent needs. 
where before they would actually access the emergency room department for that, which would lead to hospital admissions. The ED staff is wonderful. They're highly trained when it comes to emergency situations, but when it comes to oncology management, it is one of the things that they lack, especially when it comes to chemotherapy, immunotherapy related effects, disease progression, oncologic emergencies, and then fevers in the immunocompromised patients. So it all began in Smilo in 2014. And it was um, a job that was actually given to me at the time by Tom Lynch and also Rogerio Lillenbaum. And we really felt that there were too many patients that were being admitted during the course of the daytime, both on NP11 and NP12. So I contacted IT. We really looked at some qualitative data to really see exactly what was happening there. Um, so we reviewed the ED data for a five-month period of time, beginning the beginning of January through the end of May of 2014. And during that time, there were 391 oncology patients that presented to the um, Yale New Haven Hospital ED. Um, and with all those patients, 90% were admitted. So I think regardless of maybe what the issue was, because they had cancer, because it was more complex, maybe not sure about the management, they were automatically admitted. 62% of those patients um, actually arrived to the floor between the hours of nine and five. So technically, we could have been seeing those patients in our outpatient setting. And then unfortunately, the average length of stay once they were admitted was 6.74 days, which we know also it drives the whole cost of healthcare, not to mention their quality of life of being in the hospital. So most hospitalizations really resulted from their disease progression. Chart review demonstrated that many patients could have been treated in the ambulatory setting. I would say it was probably about 50% of those patients. The ambulatory setting treatment would require pharmacy infusion and also palliative care support. So this is just um, a schematic that really kind of looks at what those patients were admitted for. So you can see dehydration was about 20%. Um, disease exacerbation failure to thrive was about 14%. Fever neutropenia was about 13%. Altered mental status was 12%. Pneumonia dyspnea was 10% and abdominal pain was 10%. And these are the most common admitting diagnoses. So we really did a very thorough chart review that really helped to look at that. So fever, dehydration, altered mental status, abdominal pain, pneumonia, and dyspnea. So we put together how we were gonna look at this. So this was really kind of our project phase that we had. So the first step was program design. Next was development of the infrastructure, create a robust education plan, go live and evaluation and monitoring. So in terms of the design and infrastructure, I set up a task force to determine current practices amongst the disease teams. And on that task force, we had practice nurses, nurse coordinators, APPs from both solid tumor and hematology disease teams. We established guidelines that we had presently and what we were kind of moved towards in terms of actually developing another plan. The urgent visit program would have access to urgent palliative care as well as pharmacy and actually um, priority access to infusion chairs. Patient and caregiver calls were escalated to the practice nurse and to the APP to determine um, exactly where they would be able to go, whether they needed to be escalated to the ED or whether they would actually come to our clinic. The patient caregiver calls were escalated to the, to the practice nurse and APP. We did have epic optimization. So when patients were actually gonna be coming in as a priority visit, we actually actually named that in epic. So we were able to track that over time. The urgent visit hours were from 7.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. If we did it too late in the day, if we needed to get a CTA, maybe for someone who was gonna be a rule out for P, it would really be too late. So we kind of had that cut off of 3.30. The plan of care would be established after the patient was evaluated. Some patients were able to go home and other patients really did need to get admitted or maybe even escalated their care to a higher level by going to the emergency room. The education plan, um, the urgent visit initiative needed to be communicated with various um, members of the team, certainly patients and caregivers. We needed to be able to communicate that we do have this kind of virtual urgent visit. So we did that by signage. We did that by just verbally telling the patient and also for the new patients that were coming into the system, telling them about the program at that point. We had to educate the intake and clinical secretaries. So we have an in-basket um, telephone triage guidelines. So there were certain criteria that patients would be escalated to the ED, which included altered level of consciousness, acute onset of dyspnea, acute onset of chest pain, uncontrolled bleeding, um, and certainly anything that we felt was really unstable to be in the clinic, we would escalate to the ED. 
Nursing was also educated as well as the providers, including the APPs, the oncology fellows, and the physicians. <coughs> In terms of Go Live, we started the pro program on July 31st of 2014. Again, we worked really hard with palliative care as well as the infusion areas and pharmacy to really be able to support our patients that were coming in for an urgent visit. And this is what we looked at. So we launched it August 2014, and we actually followed the data until March of 2015. So the APPs, and I have to really give them a huge shout out for their, you know, they're really accepting of this program and really making it work. Because I think what they did during that period of time has really paved the way to what we have right now with the extended care clinic. So the APP saw a total of 401 priority visits, which is huge. It was about 18 visits per week. And out of those patients, only 21% were admitted. So I think when Maureen takes over in terms of what we do now for the ECC, you're gonna see that there's a lot of correlation with that. The impact on, on the ED visits really didn't make that much of a difference. It was only about 5%, which kind of told us something that we really couldn't sustain this program during those eight hours or even really six hours that we were actually seeing those patients. So in terms of evaluation, patients were seen as urgent visits only were admitted 21% of the time in comparison to the 90% that were being admitted that would actually went to the ED first. So it did suggest, suggest that the urgent visit program can reduce hospital admissions, and that was really what our goal was. The eight-month results demonstrate a consistent number of oncology patients still going to the ED, but we knew that we really couldn't sustain things within the clinic, and there was a lot of different reasons for that. So in order to, to, to achieve sustainability and reducing patients presenting to the ED, we felt that we needed an urgent care program that required a much higher level of dedication and support. And through that, we developed a business plan for a designated oncology urgent care. And with that also went the acceptance of the oncology care model, which is a program that is actually supported through Medicare. Again, I just would like to give a special thanks to the APPs who really made all this happen and really paved the way to what we have today. So for those of you that don't know what the oncology care model is, um, it was a program that we actually had applied for. We were one out of 187 hospitals that were actually accepted nationwide. We started our involvement July 1st of 2016, and that will go until June 30th of 2021. It's a value-based program for Medicare patients that are receiving chemotherapy, really to help, the, to help to increase the services that we provide for them. And with OCM, we were able to build a business model for the start of the extended care clinic. So this was our timeline for the ECC, and as you can see, it's really pretty robust. It was really 10 months um, and I have to say there was a lot of work by so many people that went into this to make this happen. So July 2016, we started the planning in terms of space, the workflow, and everyone knows that it's on NP12. Um, it was actually the amenity suites, which is right across from the inpatient unit. <coughs> in September of 2016, we started recruitment. So I have to say we have four APPs, we have five RNs <coughs> and five PCAs. And in terms of the APPs, we have a really nice complement of both oncology and ED experience. In December 2016 was the construction. February 2017 was the communication in which we really kind of took a roadshow. And we went out to all the different areas really talking about what ECC was going to be all about. And our opening day was on April 3rd of 2017. <coughs> Excuse me. So Maureen is going to take over now and really talk about what ECC implementation is and what we have for today. Thank you, Vana. So as Vana mentioned, um, we were really ready to get to work. So we embarked on a nine-month rapid turnaround implementation um, period, which for all of you who know on work groups, that's a really tight time frame to build a unit staff a unit, et cetera. So we did this very strategically. We identified the key stakeholders, built our multidisciplinary teams, which was a planning team, defined our work groups, and we created our timelines and deadlines that we held truly firm to throughout the process. Additionally, we started the recruitment process and we were really uh, solidly committed to having a mixture of both oncology, ED, and ICU experience on this team. 
So to do this, we created seven primary work groups. These include a logistics team, which defined the location of the ECC, scheduled all the meetings, set the timeframes. We were really fortunate that we had some underutilized space, which is unheard of these days, but we did have some underutilized space that we were able to take over and uh, repurpose to use for the ECC. We had our capital improvement team, which collaborated with finance, created the cost center and built the budget for the unit. We had an epic workflow group um, that built the department in our medical record as a hospital outpatient department. This allows when a patient is admitted to an inpatient unit for their orders to flow right through. So for ease of process for the patient, it works very well. So our EPIC team worked with us on that. We also created pathways and algorithms that would streamline the care. We had a clinical workflow group. We collaborated with laboratory medicine so all of our labs could be treated as stat labs, similar to when our patients would be in the ED. We worked with the pharmacy for a dedicated PIXIS and pharmacist. We collaborated with diagnostic imaging, social work, and consult services such as cardiology, ENT, and surgery, just to name a few. Most importantly, we worked hard to have access to our vital rapid response team. So this was a new venture for rapid response, and it actually took a, a few really healthy conversations to get them on board. And they agreed to access this and use this department and service us because we're really a hybrid unit. So while we're deemed an ambulatory unit, some of our patients there are truly inpatient and being admitted. So it was a hybrid unit. They were willing to come on board and it has um, really served us very well and ensured patient safety in the unit. So we are very appreciative of that collaboration. We also had a day in the life um, scenario set up. So this was spearheaded by our service line educator. This group included all multidisciplinary partners and consult services. We also partnered with our patient family advisory council and had members of that team participate in the day of the life with us. So we truly had the voice of the patient at the table prior to opening the unit. Orientation was another group, which included um, a comprehensive group to ensure APPs, RNs, PCAs, and BAs all had the appropriate clinical rotations through both inpatient units as well as ambulatory. And again, our recruitment process ensured that we had a, a well-bred mix of ICU, oncology, and ED experience. Last but not least was our staffing and scheduling work group. So this is actually an example of uh, the RN staffing and scheduling group for anyone who's familiar with looking at grids for staffing and scheduling. But um, it again included APPs, nurses, and PCAs. So given the retro review that uh, Vana had discussed about oncology ED volume, it showed that the majority of the patients were seen between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. We used that data to build our master staffing plans, and it still holds true today. So the majority of our patients in the ECC are seen between 11 a.m. and 5 p.m., and so we have overlapping uh, coverage for nurses and APPs between the hours of 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. So that's an example of that, and it holds true for um, all the services, APP, RNs, and PCAs. These staff cover 16 hours a day, seven days per week, 365 days per year. As with any project, you know, the final and most important part of the process was to create a comprehensive communication plan. This included st key stakeholder education to both physicians and fellows in hematology, medicine, surgery, GYN oncology, nursing and all other hospital inter interdisciplinary partners, including <laughs> security, lab, social work, et cetera. We provided the education through a variety of vectors, which included roadshows, staff meeting presentations, and printed materials. This is an example of a tent card that we used as one of our multi multifocal ways of educating folks on who we who we are. So this is the front of the card and it included important information about who we are. Um, where is the ECC located? What are our hours of operation? What our staffing complement is and our phone number and how to contact us. Additional information on the card had important answers to questions. So how can my patient be seen in the ECC? Does my patient need to be seen by my disease team first? What information is required before a patient can be sent to the ECC? Can I send my patient to the ECC instead of the ED? And examples of patients who could benefit from the ECC, including those requiring supportive care or symptom management for issues such as neutropenic fever, hydration, 
or onc emergencies and pain management, just to name a few. We really wanted to keep it concise, something user friendly where the most important questions could be answered. Feedback was very positive about the tent card. Last but not least, we were finally ready to open the ECC, which we did on April 3rd, 2017. And you can see some of our um, staff that were a part of that process in that photo. So implementing the ECC, the ECC is an absolutely beautiful space with tons of natural light. It is located on the 12th floor in what used to be the high amenity suite. So it's the corner of the building with lots of natural light. In this photo, you can actually see one of the rooms with some of the nursing staff. We have occupancy for six patients at a time within two beds and four chairs. And our patients are prioritized for tests and procedures with the same urgency as those that are in the emergency room. This allows us to provide urgent care to our sickest patients in a timely fashion. Additionally, patients in the ECC are seen by appointment only. It's not a walk-in clinic. Um, and while we've had a few instances where that has happened and we've managed it, our goal is that they're made by appointment and have our um, patients evaluated by their team first whenever possible. So to make an appointment, the primary provider calls the ECC with a referral. The patient is triaged through the APP and an appointment is made. Our patients arrive from home, clinic, or one of our care centers throughout the state of Connecticut. This slide shows our one year anniversary data. So on March 31st, we celebrated our first year. At that point, we had seen a total of 2,634 patients. And of those patients, there were 1,452 unique individual patients. The percent of patients that were discharged to home was 69%, which is outstanding given the number of patients when they go to the ED that were actually admitted. So the fact that we were discharging 69% to home was really a true success. And that holds true to today, you'll see on the next slide. The number of patients that were, were admitted inpatient were 31%, 26% of the patients were OCM patients, and 29% were seen by their physician first. Historically, Tuesdays have been our highest volume day of the week, and that holds true today. Arrival time, the highest arrival time is between 12 and 5, as we've discussed earlier, which is um, held true ever since the retro review of the emergency room data and still holds true today. So here's some of our fast facts. So this was also from our one year anniversary and I will highlight the minor changes that have happened since then. So one year we had 7.3 visits, average visits per day. We're currently at 7.5. So we bumped that up in the previous six months. We had an average of 220 visits per month, but our highest month is now July at 230 visits. Tuesday is still the highest volume day of the week. June has been our highest volume month. 69% um, of our patients are still discharged to home. The top three referring teams remain GI, thoracic, and hematology, oncology, specifically those patients with acute leukemias. The top three discharge uh, reasons, again, remain consistent, supportive care, progression of disease, or infectious complications. We have utilized and seen a 12% decrease in ED patients that have been seen in the ED. <coughs> And our mean Prasgini score, which was 100%, is still very high at 95.2% and in the 99th percentile overall for Prasgini, which is our, our outstanding results. This slide here just shows you our, where we are currently from opening to uh, the end of September. So again, still 69% of patients discharged to home, which is uh, a fantastic result. 31% of the patients admitted We've increased the number of OCM patients seen. We moved from 26% to 28%, and 28% of the patients are seen by their disease team first. So in summary, um, their urgent visit pilot program demonstrated the need for the ECC, and we successfully completed, completed a multidisciplinary rapid implementation cycle. We've realized a 12% decrease in ED visits, and overwhelmingly, 69% of our patients that are seen in the ECC are discharged home. So what were our lessons learned? We all know that we have them, especially with a tight time frame opening a brand new unit. 
So we learned that a dedicated unit for oncology patients is truly a value-added service for our patients and their families, and the data has proven that for us, as well as the patient's feedback. So in rounding in the unit, the feedback is always extremely positive, as well as the comments and letters that come in via Preschini. We learned that large initiatives with multidisciplinary teams take time, commitment, and flexibility. Everyone working on this group needed to be willing to be open to hear different feedback and really shift lanes when we needed to to make sure we would meet our deadlines successfully. Team building prior to the unit opening would have been beneficial. We had a very tight time frame, and we didn't build in a lot of time for the team to get to know each other. So we had multiple different services from ICU to oncology to ED giving that staff some time to really get to know each other for a few weeks prior to opening the unit would have been beneficial for them. And lastly, that transparent communication and multidisciplinary engagement at all levels is truly essential to our ongoing success. So we just wanted to thank our current team. So these are some of our, um, all of our APPs, nurses and ACAs who work in the unit who are dedicated every day to really providing the best care to all of our SMILO patients. And then this was our original work group who worked to open the ECC, um, who we couldn't have done it without their collaboration. And just some references. Does anyone have any questions about the ECC? 